Skybridge, a division of Recorded Books, presents Sorry, Not Sorry, Dreams, Mistakes, and Growing Up by Naya Rivera. Read by Naya Rivera. Wouldn't take nothing for my journey now, Maya Angelou. Hello, America, and hopefully other parts of the world. You might know me from shaking my butt and singing in a cheerleader costume on Glee, or from throwing shade, or dodging it, in the tabloids. Or maybe even, if you're a super fan, or just have a really good memory, from my child actor days on TV shows like The Royal Family or The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Which is exactly why I wanted to write this book. I wanted to tell my whole story and talk about the path, which was really more of a roller coaster ride, that I took to get to be who I am now, an actress, singer, wife, and mother, currently knee-deep in spit-up. Sometimes growing up happens in the blink of an eyelash extension. You spend years struggling to figure out who you are, and through a lot of those years you feel like it's going to take a bit of divine intervention for you to pull it all together. And then, all of a sudden, you find yourself sitting in the dining room, wondering what to make for dinner and what that baby-related stain on your shirt is, and your adulthood smacks you in the face. And if this hasn't happened to you yet, God willing, someday it will. Holy shit, I did it, you'll think. I'm a grown-ass woman now, and let me tell you, it'll feel good. Writing this book gave me a chance to relive some of the best and worst times of my life, from pre-dawn wake-up calls as a kindergartner, getting ready to shoot my first sitcom, to being a 20-year-old with a fat stack of unpaid bills and an anorexic wallet. But you know what's crazy? Even when I look back at that girl I was decades ago, I still feel like I just saw her yesterday, like she hasn't been gone for all that long. I started working on this book while I was still shooting Glee, and finished the last few chapters with my new baby boy Josie sitting in his chair just a few feet away. Motherhood means learning new things and having your expectations turned upside down every single day. But it has also taught me one thing for certain. Josie is my greatest success, and I will never do any better than him. So yeah, being a mom changes things and makes you feel different in a lot of ways, but for me, the big one is this. I'm braver. I've never been afraid of being an open book and telling it like it is, but now I can say with 100% confidence that zero fucks are given anymore. I don't care what other people think, because being a mom puts everything into perspective. You no longer have to decide what's important to you because it's right in front of your face and chances are he's hungry. Josie gave me wings. I know it's cheesy, but it's true. And with this book, I hope to pass on a little bit of that flight to you. Your life doesn't have to be perfect for you to be proud. In fact, I think it's the opposite. The more imperfect your life has been, the prouder you should be, because it means you've come that much further, and also probably had a lot more fun along the way. And with that, I hope you have as much fun reading this book as I had writing it. One. The Nene Years From the time I was in utero, it was my fate to be in front of the camera. The sound of flash bulbs made me kick, and I'm sure if the sonogram technology had allowed it, you'd have seen little fetus me trying to turn, so they got my good side. My mom was an aspiring actress and model when she unexpectedly got pregnant with me. She was only 20, but she'd already done pretty well for herself. She had worked a lot for Coles in her hometown of Milwaukee. And every weekend, there she was, in the Sunday paper, modeling a different sweater. Once she landed in Los Angeles, she ate chicken in a KFC commercial with David Allen Greer and wore bunny ears and danced in a freezer. What? In a Smokey Robinson video. In her first trimester, she even made an appearance on The Young and the Restless, where I tried to steal the show by causing a bout of morning sickness that left her making secret trips to the bathroom. Once I was born, Mom kept it moving and didn't miss a beat. She got me an agent before I could walk, and my grand entrance into life in the public eye was a topless scene. At seven months old, I was cast in a Kmart commercial to crawl across the floor wearing nothing but a diaper. From baby age on, I booked print ads, almost all of which were shot in front of a gray seamless, with me wearing a floral romper, Oshkosh or plum pudding, the height of late 80s, early 90s kid passion. 
Even as a top model, though, I couldn't just stand there, nor was it all fun. It was work. I had to do stuff like hula hoop, blow bubbles, pretend to laugh, or the worst, hold hands with other kids. Usually their hands were sweaty and clammy, or they'd pick their nose right up to the very last second and reach their fingers toward mine. Even though I just recently stopped wearing diapers, I was three feet tall and all business. I got the hang of modeling really quickly and easily took direction from the photographer. When other models would get all teary-eyed and hiccupy about holding hands with someone they didn't know, I was always annoyed. Why do we have to convince you? I'd think. Just do your job and hold my damn hand and take the picture. I didn't even pick my nose. I also started to book television commercials. And soon I was Mattel's go-to ethnic girl, doing ads for Cabbage Patch dolls or twirling around with a Bubble Angel Barbie. Sometimes all they wanted in the shot was my brown hand, so I'd get a manicure and then have to hold a toy, very, very still, while the cameras got their shot. My agent was a woman named Arletta Proach, who repped mostly babies and child actors. My mom had a pager so Arletta could get a hold of us when we were out running around for auditions. And when the pager would start buzzing, we always knew I'd gotten a job. We'd head straight to a payphone, and Mom would call into the agency. They'd celebrate by clanging a cowbell on their end, and on our end, my mom would pick me up so I could reach the receiver, and I'd scream as loud as I could into the phone. No matter if we were at a shopping mall in the valley or at a phone booth in the middle of Hollywood Boulevard, I practically tore out my lungs screaming bloody murder to show how excited I was. In retrospect, it's amazing my mother didn't get picked up on suspicion of kidnapping. At the time, my dad had a full-time job working in IT, which gave my mom the opportunity to devote herself full-time to my career, and she founded a company called One Plus One Management. She was my manager, and I her only client. My husband and I joke now that we're going to bring it back and that I'll represent him under One Plus One Management. Make no mistake, though, mom was no mere momager. She was a badass and really good at her job. She took my auditions very seriously and considered every detail when helping me look the part. We made a lot of trips to TJ Maxx, where we'd dig through the racks until my mom found exactly what I needed. She also invested in makeup and props. I had a mole on my chin that we'd sometimes cover up using this thick, creamy makeup that was invented for burn victims to use to cover scars. To this day, I still use it for contouring. And we got really expensive flippers made, fake teeth that we could plug in when a real one fell out. If I was auditioning to play a girl who was kind of nerdy and wore her hair in braids, you could bet I'd show up with fake glasses, braids, and some dork-ass outfit of clashing plaids and prints. Since I was mixed race, I could play a lot of different ethnicities, from just plain old dark-skinned white girl to Latino to African American. Mom stopped short of giving me a spray tan, but if I was auditioning for a role specifically for a black girl, you could bet she'd encourage me to play outside in the sun. Mom's diligence and my hard work, of course, paid off, and at age five, I landed my first television role on CBS's The Royal Family. I honestly don't remember the audition, but when I heard that I got it, I bet you could hear me scream all the way in San Diego. Created and executive produced by Eddie Murphy, the show was a family comedy that starred Red Fox and Della Reese as a retired couple who are forced to deal when their daughter and three grandchildren move in with them. I played the youngest grandchild, Hillary, and Red Fox and I were intergenerational BFFs from the moment we met. He started to tell people that I really was his granddaughter, and I believed him. He and his wife were so nice to my whole family. They were always bringing me souvenirs from their trips, like a floral lei from Hawaii or a tiny ceramic red fox. Get it? Red had a reputation for being a flashy dresser. He believed in dressing like a king, and so he got a lot of his clothes custom made to fit his opulent tastes. When he'd hit upon an outfit he really liked, he'd tell his tailor, "Get baby girl one too," and then boom, we'd be matching. Which is how Red and I ended up going on the Arsenio Hall show, looking like we'd both just raided Michael Jackson's closet. In 2013, I went on Arsenio again to talk about Glee, and he surprised me with the footage from 22 years earlier. In it, Red is wearing a red, again, get it, the man liked to work a theme, 
jacket covered in gold chains and tassels, a red beret, and giant sunglasses. I'm wearing a cream-colored two-piece suit, also covered in gold chains and tassels, with a giant crown on the back. Arsenio asks me if I want to be a model, and without missing a beat, I tell him I'm not into it because I already did that. Then he asks if I want to get married someday. My answer? No, said in a tone of voice that implied that my pre-kindergarten self had never heard such a stupid question. However, my favorite outfit that Red gave me, and possibly my favorite outfit of all time, never made a television appearance. It was a gold lame bandeau top that showed a little belly, a giant gold poofed skirt with a black net tutu underneath, and a gold biker hat. Once I came downstairs with the whole ensemble on, determined to wear it to preschool. Mom, I said, twirling around, this is so cool. People need to see this. Mom rightly figured that it might be a little much for me to go to preschool dressed like a baby Paula Abdul, and marched me right back upstairs to change. That outfit is still in a box in my closet, though. The bandeau now barely fits around my foot, which is sad because I would definitely still rock that look if I could. On the royal family, I fell in love with being on TV. I just started preschool not too long before, so I didn't really have much old life to compare my new life to. But I was still aware that I was doing something special. We'd wake up for call times at 4:30 in the morning and quietly tiptoe around and out the door so we wouldn't wake up my dad before he had to get up and go to work. I never once complained about having to get out of bed so early because secretly I knew that if I was up before the sun. I must be important. The schedule for being on a half-hour multi-camera sitcom was super regimented, but not terribly strenuous. We were finished each day by the middle of the afternoon and didn't ever have to shoot on weekends. Every Monday started with a table read of that week's script. I still couldn't read, so I was basically a parrot in pigtails. Mom would sit me on her lap and read lines off the blue paper script over my shoulder. When it would come to my lines, she'd say them out loud, and I'd repeat them back. This was usually the first time the cast would see the script, so there was always a lot of laughing and joking about the lines. Tuesdays and Wednesdays were for the blocking rehearsals we needed before shooting in front of a live studio audience, which is a lot like live theater. They use terms like downstage and upstage, and you have to learn to cheat yourself. Which means keeping your body open to the camera and the audience, no matter what you're doing. When the script called for me to do physical comedy, like running into the room while shooting red with a water gun, or making a giant mess by inexplicably pouring buckets of paint into a bird bath, I had to learn how to do it without ever turning my back toward the camera. I remember one particular scene where I had to pretend I needed to pee really bad while they slowly unspooled me from a sarong. Another episode called for me to sing a song and do a little dance, hitting three different marks along the way as I walked off camera. I shot this scene with a hundred and two degree fever, not because anyone told me I had to, but because I insisted. There was no way I was missing a day of work or a fun scene, and even though I was burning up, I nailed it. On Thursdays, we'd shoot any scenes that were too long to do in front of an audience. And then Friday was the big payoff. Shooting in front of a live audience on a Friday night always feels like a party, especially when you're only five. When the actors come in, you do a pre-curtain call where you run on set and are introduced to the audience. The adults would crack jokes, take bows, and shake hands with the audience. But since I was just a little kid, all I did was wave. Since we filmed at night, my dad was able to come when he got off work, and it always made me smile when he cheered extra loud. Sometimes people would bring presents or flowers after the taping, and after a few episodes of the show had aired, I started to get fan mail. My mom and I would sit in my dressing room with a stack of little headshot cards. She would open the letters, read them to me, and then I'd sign the card in my child's handwriting with a little heart and Naya, and then we'd send it back. To this day, I still draw a little heart when I sign my name, which actually irks me because. I think it looks childish, but I can't help it because it's totally automatic at this point. I remember one time my mom opened a letter and started to read it to me. Okay, she said, "Make it out to Eddie." 
She started to spell it out for me, then stopped. Oh, no, she said. Eddie's in jail? How does he even watch TV? Needless to say, Eddie and I would not go on to become pen pals. The royal family wasn't a kid's show, so I didn't have many fans in my peer group. But occasionally, people would see us out in public and come up to my parents to tell them how much they liked the show. One such person was Tupac, who saw us in LAX and came over to introduce himself to my mom. The story goes that he picked me up and held me for several minutes while he and my mom, who can chat up anyone, hit it off. Where are the photos of this, mom and dad? Seriously, why didn't you take pictures? Liss I, but still, Tupac held me. Legendary. On set, the cast and crew really were like a family. Every Thursday, Red's friend Bubba would make gumbo for everyone, and on the days when my mom wasn't eating gumbo, she was talking about how good it had been or how good it was going to be. I was a weirdo kid who loved shrimp, so I gobbled it up right along with her. Red Fox was most well-known for his role on Sanford and Son, a show that had been created by legendary television producer Norman Lear and was hailed as having paved the way for African-American sitcoms. Red was first and foremost a comedian, and as the title character Fred Sanford, he had a bit about having a heart attack. He'd clutch his chest dramatically and wail and moan about warning his wife that he was coming up to see her. It was all part of his shtick. On October 11th, 1991, less than a month after the royal family had premiered, Red and I were running our lines on set. He was sitting in an easy chair and I was standing on my mark in front of him, when all of a sudden he kind of slumped over and fell to the floor. For a while, no one moved. One of the producers even yelled, Red, come on! Everyone assumed it was just part of his routine, so we waited patiently for him to stand back up. Except he didn't. Della Reese, who played his wife, was the first to figure out that something really was happening. She rushed over, leaned down to him, and heard him saying, Get my wife. Get my wife. Della stood up and started screaming, which jolted everyone in the room into action. The assistant director yelled for someone to get an ambulance, and my mom, who had been sitting and watching rehearsals with Red's wife, tried desperately to calm her down and assure her that everything was going to be okay. I didn't move, though. I'd been taught to stay on my mark, and so that's what I did. My dad happened to be on set that day. Finally, he noticed that I was still standing there like a statue, so he ran over and scooped me up. He and my mom took me up to my dressing room, where they set me down with some coloring books and instructions not to move, again, while they went back downstairs and tried to help. I hadn't really known my own grandparents, so for all intents and purposes, Red was my grandpa. I was way too young to process it at the time, but now when I look back, I realize how special and unique it was for the cast of a TV show to have such off-screen camaraderie and genuine love. The whole cast and crew followed Red's ambulance to the hospital, and we sat there, his TV family and his real family, all mixed together in the waiting room, praying and trying to comfort one another. When the doctor came out to tell us that Red had passed, he delivered the news to the entire group. As you can imagine, everyone took it really hard. Red was such a presence wherever he went. He started his career in stand-up, and he was one of those people who could turn anything into a stage and anyone into his audience. He was the first person I knew who died, and I still remember his funeral, which was held in Las Vegas, very vividly. It was open casket. He looked very kingly in a white suit, and it was a fitting tribute to a man who liked to live large. Della sang What a Wonderful World, a song that can still make me teary-eyed to this day. My mom had become especially close to Red and his wife, Ka, so she took it really hard. She'd bring me to visit Red's grave, where Ka would give me a cigar, one of Red's favorite things, and tell me I could give Red a present. We'd dig a little hole, stick the cigar in it, and then she would light it. We'd watch the smoke curl up and into the air, and in my five-year-old brain, I imagined him six feet underground, smoking away in that white suit and being just the same as he always was. After Red passed, the producers briefly brought in Jack Hay to play Della's sister, 
and try to keep the show going. But as my mom said, it just wasn't the same without Red. The royal family came to an end after just one season. Glee would eventually be filmed on the same Paramount lot where we shot the royal family. And every day on my way to the set, I'd walk past the daycare where my mom would drop off my baby brother before she and I would head to work. I loved the Paramount lot, and returning to work there so many years later felt like a homecoming. It made me think about my TV beginnings and read a lot. He was one of the first people to really believe in me, and I've always wanted to make him proud. Someday, I'm going to take that fox and a Ouija board over to stage 16 and see if I can say hello. I'd love to tell him what I'm up to and make sure he knows just how much I love that gold lame bando top. Slaying it in the early 90s. At this point in my life, I didn't know that much about school, but I knew that I liked acting better. I was around adults all the time. I was getting attention, and I got to wear fancy clothes and do silly things that would have gotten me in trouble had I tried to do them at home. After the royal family was canceled, and I wasn't going to an onset tutor anymore, my parents enrolled me in the local public elementary school. At night, after I finished my homework, my mom would make me get my lines for whatever audition I had coming up and go into her room. When I was super little, Mom would just repeat everything over and over and have me repeat it back to her. Even ones I could read, though, she still made me go off book every time I went into a casting. This meant I couldn't walk in a room and read my lines from a piece of paper, even if that's what everyone else was doing. I had to memorize them. To this day, I can still learn my lines super fast and can recall conversations I had months ago nearly verbatim. My poor husband, right? For the first 16 years of my life, my mom was the only acting coach I had. She was damn good at it, too. She'd give me pointers on delivery and body language, like, okay, but next time put your hand on your hip when you say that word. Or she'd demonstrate the facial expressions to make when I was supposed to get people to laugh, or when I was supposed to look mad or unhappy. In a lot of ways, my mom and I had a very adult relationship, but at the core, I was still a kid. Sometimes our nightly sessions of running lines would end in a screaming match with me crying because I just wanted to play, or frustrated because I didn't think she was listening to me. I also hated some auditions, especially those kid cattle calls for commercials that involved several hours of standing in line. Eventually, I got savvy enough to bargain when I knew that an audition would be particularly annoying, which was how I ended up with an all-white bunny named Duchess. Ah, Duchess. I was super into her for, like, the first two days, then totally forgot about her. Eventually, her tiny bunny water bottle proved to be no match for a summer day in Valencia, and she succumbed to heat stroke. After Duchess, Mom wised up, and my rewards were only of the inanimate variety. The first thing I booked after the royal family was a guest spot on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. While I hated commercial auditions, I took television auditions very seriously. I remember that I was barely out of that casting when I burst into tears. I was convinced that I'd done a horrible job and wasn't going to get it. Then we got a page from Arletta, and I went from mid-meltdown to screaming with joy into a payphone. The role I landed was only for one episode and one scene, which wasn't even with Will Smith, but I was on set long enough for him to call me cute. My mom and I were sitting on some stairs rehearsing my lines, and we were unintentionally blocking the entrance to his dressing room. He came by and asked us to move, but also introduced himself and called me pretty. I beamed. Wow, Mom, that's the fresh prince. So yeah, Tupac and Will Smith? I was totally slang in the early 90s. After this, I booked a recurring role on Family Matters. I have to be honest. I think this was when I reached my prime in terms of my physical appearance. I played Gwendolyn, who was the seven-year-old love interest of Little Richie, and the costume department really knew what it was doing. Gwendolyn had the best hair and the best outfits. Her hair was always half up, half down, and full of scrunchies. Each of her outfits was made up of at least 17 articles of clothing. It was all about the layers. 
She'd be in leggings under a skirt with a long-sleeved shirt under a short-sleeved shirt with a bandana around her neck, and then they'd top it all off with something like a pair of little yellow socks and red Chuck Taylors. On a Valentine's Day episode, they paired a red dress with a leopard print coat and a big red flower in my hair. The look beats any red carpet ensemble I've worn to this day. Another highlight was when I got to drive a battery-powered Barbie Jeep. This made a huge impression on me. I thought it was the coolest thing ever, and I loved it so much that it, unfortunately, influenced my taste in real cars when I finally got my driver's license more than ten years later. Richie wasn't just my on-screen love. Off-screen, I was convinced I was going to marry him. He could dance, and he had the best Jerry Curl on TV. What more could a girl want? I thought he looked like Michael Jackson, and I was obsessed. I'd call his house to talk to him, and Richie and I would tie up the phone lines for hours. As to what our conversations were actually about, beats me. The pinnacle of our romance was the Family Matters rap party. As all the adults were getting drunk and the older kids were being cool, Richie and I burned up the dance floor until we were sweaty, him with his Michael Jackson moves and me with the running man, which I had mastered so well that it should have been in the special skills section of my resume. Alas, sometimes young love is just not meant to last, and I have no idea where Richie is these days. Nor, if I'm being honest, can I even remember his real name. My on-screen roles definitely led to some off-screen perks. Michael Jackson's niece was also an actor, and we were on several auditions together. Over time, our moms became friends, enough so that I was invited to her birthday party at Neverland Ranch. I was still too young to really understand what was so special about it, but my mom was freaking out, even though she wasn't allowed to come with me. The girl's mom assured us that there were chaperones, and that Michael was not one of them. The day of the party, we all met at a central location, where we would be taken to the ranch. Everyone else on the bus was like, 12 or 13, but I was a freaking baby, small enough that I was still wearing white tights. Nicole Ritchie was one of the other kids on the bus, and when she saw a five-year-old climb on board by herself, Nicole and her friend took me under their wing and let me sit with them. The bus ride was so long that I got sleepy and laid down and took a nap in Nicole's lap. When I woke up, I saw that I drooled all over her leg. Once we were at Neverland, we rode the rides and watched a movie in a full-size theater. I remember walking up to a concession stand that was filled with popcorn and candy. I had planned on just drooling at the snacks from behind the glass because I didn't have any money. But then the guy working the counter said, Do you want anything? Everything is free here. If this had been a movie, we would have cut to a trippy echo sequence at that moment Everything is free. Everything is free. I'd never heard anything so glorious in my brief little life. I gobbled up Sour Patch Kids and Raisinets and Twizzlers and then stayed awake for the entire bus ride home, all hopped up on sugar. The first ethnic Dorothy, at my elementary school at least. I booked one of the most important roles of my career far away from Hollywood, when I played Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. No, not on Broadway, but even better, at Valencia Valley Elementary School. The school put on The Wizard of Oz every year, and the teacher in charge was this biggish woman who always wore oversized moo-moos and had long gray hair. During story time, she'd make kids rub her bunions. I was totally disgusted by it at the time, and now that I look back on it, I wonder, how did this bitch not get fired? But that's an aside. The Wizard of Oz was her passion, and she was obsessed with making it as good as it could be. The year that I could audition, she was practically salivating at the chance to have a professional actress in the lead role. She went through the dog and pony show of holding auditions, but I knew I was going to get it. Hello, I had credits. I was such a little monster back then that I'm surprised I didn't walk in and hand her my resume. Afterward, I stood in a circle of girls who had tried out for the part and put on a show of asking everyone who they thought was going to get it. Even at the time, I knew that was bratty behavior, but did it anyway. Diva antics aside, 
the show was a hit. In the video, you can see me hitting every mark and making sure I enunciate every line. My parents were just as proud then as they were when I landed a role on national television. My mom even stayed up the night before, covering my shoes with gold glitter and red spray paint. The Wizard of Oz was definitely the highlight of my elementary school years. Even though I was still just in the single digits, it was pretty obvious that school and I weren't destined to get along. I got suspended twice before I even made it to fifth grade. My family moved a lot, and in total, I went to three different elementary schools. I was never nervous about being the new kid, though, and always had a pretty easy time making friends. In second grade, I met my friend Madison, who is still my best friend to this day. Other friendships didn't have quite the same staying power. In fourth grade, I befriended this girl Sarah, who was a total tomboy and kind of a bully. One day, she decided to spin me around by my hair. I screamed and screamed for her to stop, trying to keep up before she ripped my ponytail completely off my head. When she wouldn't stop, I resorted to more drastic measures and bit the hell out of her arm. It was a little bit of real-life foreshadowing of the Glee episode where Santana gets her ass kicked by Lauren and resorts to biting. That aside, somehow I got suspended and that bitch Sarah got off scot-free even though she'd started it. Unlike the creepy Bunyan teacher, not every teacher at the schools I attended was stoked about having an actress in their midst. At one school, it was clear from day one that the principal had it out for me and didn't consider acting a worthwhile pursuit. My parents were constantly fighting with the school to get it to recognize my onset tutor hours, and you could see the look of disdain on the principal's face every time my mom would try to talk to her about how I was going to miss a few more days of school because of shooting. Like anyone learns anything in elementary school anyway. One day I was sitting in class minding my own business when I was suddenly called into the principal's office. Naya, she said with all the seriousness of a counterterrorism agent interrogating a member of ISIS. Do you recognize this note? She slid a piece of paper across the table and, sure enough, I did recognize it. It was a note I'd written to my friend Kate about a boy in our class. Johnny smells so bad, I'd scrawled in pencil across a piece of wide ruled paper. Sometimes I want him to die. When I nodded, she sat back smugly in her chair. This, she said, is a very serious matter. She called in my mom and announced that I was getting suspended yet again, but this time for making a death threat against a fellow student. My mom is not the kind of woman to take anything lying down, but I think at this point she'd had enough of this school and decided she wasn't wasting any more time on this woman than she already had. She just shrugged, told me to gather up my stuff, and we went home. It was the one time in my life that I didn't get in trouble with my parents for getting in trouble at school. Instead, I played in the park, watched tons of Nickelodeon, and had a pretty nice little vacation. Even as a child, I knew that acting was a job, and I liked that feeling of responsibility. I liked to work hard and felt fulfilled knowing that I was good at something. Sometimes this work ethic leaked into other areas of my life. I was competitive and didn't just play. I couldn't understand how other kids could do something and not try their absolute best. For example, between the ages of 6 and 10, I was an absolute beast when it came to handball. How this became my passion du jour, I have no idea, but I practiced at home so I could dominate the playground handball scene at recess. I was the champ of the court, and I got real mean when other people didn't take it as seriously as I did. In my grade, there was this one girl, Melissa, who was rumored to have been a crack baby or something, and she had a deformed hand. When we played handball, we turned into a bunch of trash-talking seven-year-olds, and Melissa made the mistake of calling me poor. I turned around and yelled, Oh yeah? Why are you playing handball anyway when you only have one hand? Then I went right back to whacking the shit out of that ball. I later apologized to Melissa because as soon as I walked off the court, the other kids were like, Yo, Naya, that's messed up. And as the sweat dried off my forehead, I had to admit that, yes, it was really fucked up. So, lesson learned. Not all is fair in the name of love and handball. 
being a child actor, and living to tell the tale. The royal family only lasted one season, but I really believe that it had all the elements of a great sitcom and could have been as successful as The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air or Family Matters if Red hadn't passed away. When this happened, my family obviously mourned Red's death, but we also mourned the passing of the show. That kind of opportunity doesn't come along very often, and when I was cast on the show, we saw it as the beginning of a long career. It was tough to watch it kind of sputter to a halt less than a year later. I could have been the Tatiana Ali of my day, and picking up residuals forever. In retrospect, though, I think that everything happened for me with my career at the perfect time. If I'd been a successful kid actor, I'd probably be way more crazy than I am now, and doing fucked up things with those residual checks. I think it's hard for child actors to make the transition to adulthood, on screen and off screen, because they have everything they want at such an early age. You get tons of attention, and people are always telling you how great you are, not to mention all the material perks. Even though you're a little kid, people turn you into the boss. This happens especially when the kid becomes the breadwinner in the family, and I think that is hard for the kids and the parents. How are you going to discipline a kid when they're the one making all the money? Also, when you're super successful as a little kid, you're not mentally developed enough to understand that things could change at any time. You just think your life is always going to be this cool. Then, all of a sudden, you hit that awkward stage in life. Your roles start to dry up and you're back to being a normal kid, even though you're totally unprepared for normalcy. Even if you still manage to keep it somewhat together, you're always going to struggle to get casting directors and audiences to see you as anything other than that kid from that thing. Refer to Haley Joel Osment or Jonathan Lipnicki. I find the Olsen twins incredibly impressive because they somehow manage to make the switch from cute kids to cool adults without losing their minds. But I also think it's no surprise that they decided to focus on something other than acting. Sometimes I get annoyed when people assume I was just starting out when I was on Glee, when I've really been working since I was five. But on the whole, I'm really thankful that I got to have several years of low-key behind-the-scenes training. As frustrating as it is not to get what you want right away, success is a lot sweeter when it's a slow build. You want to always be getting better and to be moving on to bigger opportunities. You want to be looking forward, not looking back, wistfully at how you had everything you'd ever wanted at age six. Who wants to peak as a kid, as a teenager, or even in their early 20s? Then it's all downhill for the next six decades, and that's just, well, yikes. I plan to live a long time, and I want each stage of my life to get progressively more fancy. If it's all uphill from here, and I've still got some work to put in, then that's fine by me. I prefer it that way. Sorry. Making fun of an alleged crack baby on the playground. Wherever you are, Melissa, I am so sorry about that. Male prisoners writing fan letters to a five-year-old. Oof, just creepy. Missed photo ops with super hot legendary rappers, though this sorry mostly falls on my parents. Drooling on Nicole Richie's knee. Sorry, girl. Red Fox's premature death and losing such a talented comedian, a warm person, and a loving surrogate grandpa. Not sorry. Getting introduced to my passion, acting, while still in preschool, and knowing even then that it was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Learning to memorize lines before I even learned to spell an invaluable skill that stuck with me. All the outfits Red got me. Can't go wrong with head-to-toe gold. And all the outfits I got to wear on Family Matters. That Barbie Jeep, though. That I didn't become a famous child actor, or peak at age nine. Two, I am my own after-school special. Learning to love the skin I'm in. Think back to yourself as a preteen. Puberty hasn't hit yet, but it's starting to peek around the corner, so you're all kinds of awkward. Braces, training bras that are flat fabric on an even flatter chest, hairy legs, 
weird growth spurts that leave some parts of your body longer than they should be and others shorter. Nothing about you is proportionate. Nothing is cute. These awkward years smacked the shit out of me. I hated my quarter white, quarter black, half Puerto Rican, and all frizz hair. And my boobs weren't even boobs. They were just big nipples. All the girls I knew at school were starting to wear bras, but when I asked my mom to take me shopping for one, she, old lady of complete and total bluntness, just looked me up and down and asked, What for? By the end of elementary school, my acting career had totally dried up. At that age, you're too old to play a cute kid, too young to play a hot teenager, and basically no one wants you. Everything is made even weirder by the fact that you know so many people. I'd go in and audition for the same casting directors who'd once gushed over me as a five-year-old, and I could practically see them grimace, like, woof, it's unfortunate how this one turned out. I was still giving it a shot, though, and taking vocal lessons to try and keep myself good and ready should that big break suddenly materialize. My teacher was an old standard singer, and she taught me Billie Holiday jazz tunes and classic Broadway numbers. They were huge songs with tons of runs and show-stopping high notes, but way too big for a kid, which is why I developed vocal nodules at the age of ten. I'd been overexerting myself and basically screaming to hit these notes, and the result was that I had to go on serious vocal rest and fire my singing teacher. I had a complete sobbing breakdown in the car upon hearing the news. I thought my voice was going to be gone forever. I'm never going to sing again. Shh, Naya, shh, my mom said, trying both to calm me down and keep me quiet. It also didn't help that I was a big recess screamer, yelling bloody murder for no good reason as I ran around the playground. For the next several weeks, I had to avoid talking as much as possible and would catch myself during heated games of handball when I'd score and turn around triumphantly ready to talk some shit only to remember my vocal rest and realize that shit-talking isn't nearly as impressive when you have to whisper it. It also didn't help that my parents' marriage was still rocky. Just the year before, my dad had had an affair while my mom was pregnant with my sister. She kicked him out, and I remember going to visit him at his apartment, which was your stereotypical sad dad bachelor pad. Dirty beige carpet that no amount of shampooing can clean, a futon as a bed— and just enough dishware to heat up a burrito. I was like, Dad, this is gross. You need to go home. Meanwhile, my mom and her pregnancy hormones weren't faring much better. She was a devotee of the Scorn Lady playlist, always crying in her room to some Anita Baker or Tony Braxton. Mom, I said, talk to Dad. The next time I saw my dad, I said, Dad, talk to Mom. Finally, they hired a babysitter to watch my brother and me, and when we came home, they were sitting together at the kitchen table. Mom turned to us and said, Your father's moving back in. Woohoo! Shortly thereafter, Dad got a new job and we moved out of our cute but tiny house into a big new one. I got my own room with one of those amazing window seats where the cushion lifts up so that you can hide or just store stuff in there, and I got to pick out a decorating scheme. Pink and white, bitches! But a new house didn't solve the family problems. Far from it. I just felt anxious all the time. I missed working and the sense of routine and purpose that came with it. I also just straight up loved acting, and although a part of me knew that the reasons I wasn't getting roles were out of my control, a bigger part of me took it as a sign that there was something wrong with me. I felt lost and didn't know what to do with myself. I went into junior high feeling like a loser and a has-been. I didn't want to come home after school and watch TV. I wanted to be on TV. One day, I just decided to see how long I could go without eating. I never thought I was fat. If anything, my lack of boobs and scrawny legs told me that I was actually too skinny. But being extra OCD about food soon became my thing. It gave me something to think about all day, and it was a secret that I could obsess over without anyone else knowing about it. I just avoided food at all costs. If my mom had packed a lunch for me, I'd either trash it or find some excuse to give it away. If she'd given me money to buy my lunch, I just didn't use it and would save it for the weekends. 
My eating habits, or total lack thereof, didn't really stand out at school since it seemed like everyone I sat with at lunch was also on her own weird food trip. My best friend Madison was able to convince her mom to buy her Slim Fast bars, and there were other girls in my grade who cranked through a six-pack of Diet Coke in a day, all while nibbling on the same bag of pretzels. In my own sick and twisted way, I'd look at those girls who were sort of dieting and feel superior. Because you want to know how to really lose weight? Just don't eat anything. Ever. All through my years of working and auditions, no one had ever called me chubby, so my budding anorexia had nothing to do with work. I just hated everything about myself. My mom worried that I'd catch a cold when I left for school in the morning in California because my hair was still wet and dripping with gel in a desperate attempt to keep it from curling itself into a mushroom cloud. I also had a mole on my chin that made me feel like a haggard old witch, and I got teased nonstop about it. Naya's so gross with that mole on her chin, I wonder if hair grows out of it, people would say loudly enough for me to hear. I knew that I wasn't one of the prettiest or the most popular girls in school. I wasn't a total outcast. All the popular kids gathered in the quad at lunch or between classes, and I could hang out there too if I wanted, but I knew I wasn't going to win the crown at any school dances. I couldn't work my way into being the prettiest girl in school, but my level of popularity seemed like something that I could control, so soon I was splitting my time between not eating and trying to up my social status. Every day I'd scheme on it. I'd come home from school, do my homework, bluff my way through dinner, and then sit down to decompress and pick apart my day. I had this blue spiral-bound notebook that I'd gotten from the Ross Dress for Less discount department store. The cover had a moon on it with journal printed across the front in silver script. In it, I'd write things like, Dear Diary, Today sucked. This is why. 1. My outfit wasn't on point. My t-shirt was too big and didn't fit right. My shoes looked dirty, and my mom still won't let me stuff the tongues with socks. 2. My hair looked wet in the morning, but was a frizz fest by the time I got to geography. Don't use bedhead after party anymore. Go back to pink oil moisturizer. It's supposed to last all day. 3. Cindy's mad at me because I can't spend the night this weekend. Hopefully she'll still let me borrow her Chronic 2 album. Mom won't let me buy it, and I love that song, Can't Make a Ho a Housewife. 4. Why don't I have a pager? Everyone else has a pager. I must get a pager. 5. Study for math tests. Mr. Johnson announces grades when he hands papers back, and now everyone knows I got a D. 6. Eat fewer crackers. Today I had 5. 4 tomorrow. Max. 7. Talk to everyone in the quad, even if I don't really like them. 8. Get more butterfly clips. Tomorrow will be better. XO. Naya. I'd emerged from a good journaling session with a clear sense of purpose and a list of demands that usually seemed completely unreasonable and out of left field to my parents. Dad, I'd scream as I emerged from my bedroom, can you take me to get a yellow shirt? I need a yellow shirt. Nine times out of ten, they'd flat out refuse. So I'd head back to the journal to figure out a plan B. The junior high I went to made us wear uniforms, so I didn't have much to work with in the wardrobe department. But all the finesse and signifiers of your clique was in how you styled it. My style icon was Brittany, the coolest girl in school. Our uniforms were made up of a rather dumpy pair of khaki shorts that came down almost to our kneecaps and a giant thick white cotton polo or t-shirt with sleeves that hung down to our elbows. Brittany, however, was totally unrestrained by these two horrible articles of clothing. She would take the t-shirt and roll the sleeves all the way up to her shoulders, then tie them together across the back with a piece of gift-wrapping ribbon, even curling the ends so they hung down between her shoulder blades in spirals. Then she'd take her shorts and roll them up so high that you could practically see her underwear. Really, it looked like she was wearing a giant diaper and had just taken a shit in her pants. However, everyone was super into it, so I was like, well, obviously I gotta do that. But my legs were so skinny that it looked like I was walking around in a pair of double XL Depends, 
Not a super cool Britney diaper, so ah.、Uh, file that under just another popularity plan that backfired. I was also always shooting myself in the foot by getting can duty at lunch. Can duty was basically the junior high chain gang and our school's version of detention. If you were late to classes, got caught passing notes, or back talked to a teacher, you were assigned to spend your entire lunch period going around the school grounds and picking up cans. What was worse, to ensure that you really did it, you had to collect at least fifty cans each time. And trust me, even if my hair looked good that day, and I'd rolled up my sleeves and tied them with the absolute coolest glittery pink ribbon in all of Valencia. No one was going to want to talk to me while I was digging through the trash in search of Dr. Pepper cans. I convinced my dad to help me out by raiding the recycling at his office. So for the entirety of my eighth grade year, he was driving around with a bunch of garbage in the back seat of his car, so I could turn in my requisite cans and still have time to glad hand my way through lunch hour. Ah, the sacrifices that parents make for their children. Finally, eighth grade graduation rolled around, and as a celebration, my mom let me do two things that had previously been banned in the Rivera household: shave my legs and straighten my hair. Or, to be more precise, my mom did both for me. The day of our graduation ceremony, convinced that I'd nick the hell out of my knees and bleed to death, she had me sit on the side of the bathtub and lathered up my legs, only from the knee down, of course. And did the shaving for me with a little pink plastic disposable razor. I also got a new outfit, a little orange two-piece with matching sequin top and bottom, and walked across that stage feeling like I was on top of the world. I had straight hair and smooth legs. What the hell could go wrong? High school hell. At first, it seemed that high school was going to live up to my mile-high expectations. My best friend Madison had a boyfriend, and all around me, everybody was getting boyfriends. Inevitably, get a boyfriend was soon added to my nightly to-do lists, and it became my mission. As I'd walk down the halls in between classes, I'd scan the boys' passing faces. Who was going to be my boyfriend? Soon, I had a target. Stuart would be my boyfriend. Stuart and I had barely talked, and I knew practically nothing about him except that he was half white, half black, mixed race, just like me. So, duh! Obviously, this was going to work. Stuart and I could do this. We started to exchange a few more words here and there. He'd come up to my locker during passing period and ask for a piece of gum, and I would give it to him. Then one day, Madison and I walked past him and his friend Alex as we were leaving the quad. "Hey, Naya!" Alex yelled. "He wants you to be his girlfriend." Stuart just stood there. "Okay," I yelled back, and it was Alex who flashed us a thumbs up. Still, though, success! I had a boyfriend. The next day, I walked up to Stuart and got his phone number, figuring that if we were going to be in a relationship. Then we'd better start talking on the phone, because that's what boyfriends and girlfriends did in the ninth grade, talked on the phone, a lot. Except Stuart didn't have much to say. Forget that. Stuart didn't have anything to say. I had wanted it to last, but alas, Stuart just didn't seem to be the one. So the next day, I told Alex to tell him that I was dumping him. Alex seemed totally up to the task and asked no questions. Madison couldn't believe that I'd broken up with Stuart, but I felt confident in my decision since I now knew that having a boyfriend wasn't really all it was cracked up to be. I was also certain that I knew what key qualities my future true love would have. He has to be successful in some career or working toward it, financially well off and able to spoil me rotten. Driving a nice car, no POSs. Handsome, possibly male model material, preferably with long hair. Sexy, funny, has to be able to laugh with me, not at me. Creative, i.e., music, art, etc. Sensitive but not gay. Romantic, 
but not corny. A good kisser. Good in bed. Good at kissing my ass. Able to cook, because I can't. Able to clean, plus not bitch at me for it. Able to travel with me. Spontaneous, responsible. At the same spiritual level as me, wherever I am at that time. Nice to the family. Able to go out to dinner a lot. Able to afford several trips to Rodeo Drive. Nice. Patient, Ugh, especially with me. All or mostly all of these things. Even though I'd changed schools and my love life was looking up, I still wasn't eating. I'd always been thin, but now I was in skin and bones territory. In junior high, when we'd lived in an apartment complex, I'd sneak down to the gym and spend hours on the elliptical machines to burn off the few calories that I'd consumed that day. Now that we were in our own house, I'd do yoga videos in my room or even just secretly jog in place when I thought no one was looking. I'm surprised I didn't wear a hole in my carpet. In PE, while other girls tried to avoid sweating as much as possible, I took every timed mile and game of softball very seriously, not wanting to miss any opportunity for more exercise. I'd come home from school starving and cranky, and hoped that my mom didn't notice. I needn't have worried, because for the most part, she didn't. She had my brother and sister to deal with. Both of whom were still in elementary school, the family was starting to have money problems again, and though she and my dad were back together, they were fighting more than ever, to the point where sometimes I'd have no choice but to round up Michael and Nikayla and usher them out the door, talking about how fun it would be for the three of us to go to the park for a while. But by the time I was a sophomore, I started to get the feeling that what had begun as a game had maybe gone too far. One day I was so hungry that I was shaking, and I decided to eat an apple. Instead of eating it, though, I just sat there and held it up to my mouth. Couldn't bring myself to take a bite. It was like the two sides of my brain were competing. One of them telling me to eat it; it's just an apple, and the other telling me, "No, no, no, that'll ruin everything." My parents were starting to clue in, and I also felt like I was losing control. It turns out that. Routinely denying your body nutrients and being hungry twenty four seven is a great way to bring on a mental freakout. I finally worked up the nerve to tell my dad that I thought I was anorexic, which was a slap in the face to my parents. I don't think that either of them had even known anyone with an eating disorder before, and while they knew it was a big deal, they still had no idea what to do about it. At one point, my mom even said, "Naya, this is some white people shit." When we would all sit down to dinner as a family, I'd go to great pains to hide the food, so that it would still disappear from my plate, even though I hadn't eaten a thing. Our dining table was this big wooden hunk with drawers on one side, which was super convenient for me. When no one was looking, I'd scoop the food into the drawer and quickly shut it again. Usually, I'd come back to get it later and throw it away, but not always. So gross, right? I was like Brittany Murphy's character in Girl Interrupted with the chickens. One day, my mom opened the drawer and found a bunch of rotting mashed potatoes and old chicken breasts that I'd stashed in there, who knows when, and forgotten about. For the obvious reason, she flipped and came screaming into my room. She started wailing on me. I was running from her, and she yelled, "What's wrong with you? Why are you doing this? This is sick. This is sick. You need help." I knew I needed help, and she should probably be the one to help me. This only added fuel to the fire of our disintegrating relationship. The war between moms and their teenage daughters is an epic one, fought in households around the world. And in the case between me and my mom, we both had enough of our own shit going on that we had a hard time putting ourselves in each other's shoes. My mom has never been a great communicator, and she's also a tough-ass lady. It's one of the qualities I admire most in her, but she does struggle with empathy. She's the last person on earth who's going to feel sorry for you, and at this point in my life, that was all I wanted.
It didn't and wasn't going to happen, though, and so on the pages of my journal that weren't filled with calorie-counting lists of everything I'd eaten that day and social climbing plans, I'd scroll, I hate my mom, over and over. July 3rd, 2001 I hate my mom. She's a bitch. I wish she would love me back the way I love her. If she read this, she would probably beat me up. I hate her. July 22nd, 2001. Journal. I don't hate my mom. I just don't like her a lot of the time. At the worst of it, I was five foot four inches tall and weighed 98 pounds. I passed out from dehydration when we had to run a mile in P.E., during which I really pushed myself. I had to be taken to the hospital to get an IV. Since it had already been established that my mom was not well equipped to deal with this, most of it fell on my dad. He picked me up from school and took me to the hospital, and we sat there, mostly in silence, as I got a needle in my arm. Naya, you've got to eat, he'd say. I don't know what else to tell you. You're killing yourself. I'd nod, with tears streaming down my face, but then I'd be right back up on my feet after the IV, and the next day I'd throw my lunch in the trash once again. After an additional hospital visit, my dad seemed to realize that something drastic needed to be done, and that he was going to have to be the one to do it. Someone told him he should take me to see a psychiatrist, so he did, but the visits were as useless as I would have expected them to be. November 6, 2001 I can't take this. I'm starving. I just had a freaking breakdown because I couldn't even eat an apple. I don't want to tell anyone because they'll just think it's old and be annoyed. I don't have a problem. I just suppress my hunger. I can't stop thinking about it. It's driving me crazy. All I think about is what I've eaten today and what I'm going to eat tomorrow. Dad would come and pick me up after school and then drive me to the psychiatrist's totally depressing and incredibly sterile-looking office. I'd sit on the couch and get asked a bunch of predictable questions. He'd ask me over and over again why I'd felt the need to do this, a question that I could readily answer. Not eating made me feel in control. I'd already self-diagnosed. I knew why I did this. If the guy had been worth his copay, he probably would have realized that it was my control issues that needed to be addressed here, and that by working on them, the eating disorder would probably resolve itself. Instead, he decided that I must be depressed, and prescribed Lexapro, an antidepressant. My parents aren't pill-popping people, so I think under normal circumstances they would have balked at putting their teenage daughter on psychotropics. But at this point, they were at their wit's end and willing to try anything that an expert told them would work. I've never dealt with anything like this before, my mom would say. I wish I knew how to help you. I was prescribed a very small dosage, but still, taking the pills made me feel weird, like I was two steps removed from everything around me. I hated feeling out of it, so I secretly started to throw the pills away while pretending to take them. I knew that something was wrong with me, but I also knew I wasn't depressed. Finally, I told my parents that I wanted to stop taking the pills, which really meant that I was ready to stop having to pretend that I was taking the pills. There was an unspoken understanding among the three of us that since I had gotten myself into this, I would somehow know how to get myself out. And I did. Toward the end of my sophomore year of high school, I became friends with a group of black girls at school who, unlike the white girls I knew who considered a slim fast bar to be a meal, had no desire to be skin and bones. They preached to me about how guys like thick girls with asses and curves. Since at this point in my life, my only guy experience was my 12-hour relationship with Stuart, I decided that I should probably try to get another boyfriend. These girls were friends with a bunch of jocks, and since there were a couple of guys on the football team I wouldn't mind making out with, that, amazingly enough, was all it took to get me to start eating again. Soon, instead of agonizing over an apple, I was going through the McDonald's drive through twice a day. I gained 15 pounds and never looked back. The Big 1-8 and Making Big Decisions 
My child acting money had gone into something called a Coogan account, which is kind of like an official trust set up to make sure that your parents don't steal all your money. More on this later. You get access to it when you turn 18, and a good portion of my high school years was spent dreaming about what I'd do as soon as I got access to my account. I knew exactly what I was going to do with part of it, at least. I'd always been made fun of for being flat-chested, but as long as I was really skinny, barely their boobs were part of the package. As soon as I got thick, though, I wanted T-I-T-S. My dad's colleague was married to this diminutive Dominican trophy wife, Erica, who was super cute, fun to be around, and the proud owner of some amazing-looking fake tits. Erica was extra nice to me and took my awkward teenage self under her wing. The first time I ever ate pop brownies was at her house because she seemed to always be cooking up a batch and let me try one. She shopped almost exclusively at Barney's and designer boutiques, and the first time I ever went shopping on Rodeo Drive, she was the one who took me. I felt very pretty woman, except without the prostitution. Her uniform was always sassy little bodycon dresses, even though she'd had two kids, and that made her even more of a superwoman in my eyes. I'd babysit her kids whenever she needed me to, and she paid me really well, and even let me raid her closet. She had tons of velour Juicy Couture sweatsuits, which were the absolute apex of L.A. fashion in 2004. So I'd borrow those and even spritz myself with her perfume, total stalker style. She had already had breast implants, but when she got them done for the second time, I helped out and watched the kids while she was recovering from the surgery. When she came back, she showed me her new toys. Wow, I said, those are fantastic. When I turn 18, I am totally getting my boobs done. Without missing a beat, she handed me a business card and said, See him! So I did. When I became a legal adult, I came complete with a plastic surgeon. As soon as I got access to my Coogan account, I made an appointment for a consultation. I had already told my parents about my plans, but they were, no surprise, staunchly opposed to the idea. I asked my mom to come with me, and in protest she said no. I do not condone this, she said icily sitting at the kitchen table with her back to me. I was completely undeterred and just drove myself to the appointment. At the doctor's, I told them when my birthday was and when I wanted to schedule the appointment, and then I wrote a check for the $8,000 procedure so it was paid for before I even walked out the door. When it came time to have the surgery, I took a week off school. I went around to all my teachers, told them I was going to be out, and gathered up all the assignments that I was going to miss. Where are you going? Many of them asked, assuming that I was headed off on a family vacation to Hawaii or something of the sort. I'm getting plastic surgery, I'd tell them gleefully, then head right back out the door. My art teacher was stoked, though, when I told her. She said that she, too, had fake tits and that she was very excited for me. I can't wait to see what they look like when you come back, she said, which under many other circumstances could be interpreted as totally creepy. The day of the procedure, my dad decided to drive me. I was living with him at the time, and as much as I don't think he liked the idea, he also knew that letting his teenage daughter drive herself to and from surgery was a guaranteed way to win him the Worst Parent Award. I was dressed for the occasion, wearing a hot pink, juicy couture sweatsuit, Ugg boots, and a Tiffany heart locket necklace. I'm pretty sure this is the official getting fake tits outfit as designated by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. I was not scared one bit about going under or about how painful the recovery process might be. And after the surgery, I didn't hurt much at all. And I didn't even need to take the painkillers they'd given me. Back home at my dad's, I was up and walking around until he convinced me I should probably take a pain pill and go to bed, because staying up all night after surgery, as though nothing had happened, was probably not a good idea. Madison was the first person to visit. She came over to see them and brought me Jamba Juice. My mom eventually came around to my new boobs as well. She had to admit that they looked pretty great, and she started to help me shower and change my bandages, both of which were hard to do on my own. For a while, I had restrictions on what I could do. I couldn't lift anything heavy or raise my arms above my head, and I had to make sure to massage the implants against a wall so they wouldn't get hard. 
This looked as awkward and as weird as you might imagine, kind of like a cat rubbing up against a pole. My new boobs were a confidence thing, not a sexual thing. I'd never even taken my top off for a guy. I hadn't had many opportunities to do so, but even if I had, it probably wouldn't have happened because my bra was always stuffed with napkins or, if I'd managed to sneak them, my mom's chicken cutlets. Even after I got my implants, it was still a long time before anyone but Madison and my mom saw them. Not that the boys didn't try. As soon as I went back to school, they were all extra nice and practically fell over themselves rushing to see who could hold the door open for me. When I went to see my art teacher, she was super impressed. Do you mind if I ask, she said, who did these? So I pulled a business card out of my backpack, handed it to her, and said, see him. Calling a truce with my body image. Thankfully, more than a decade after all this stuff happened, I'm happy to say that I no longer treat my body like it's my enemy. Now I love to cook for myself and my family, and since I know how bad fast food is for you, even when it tastes good, you won't find me cruising around town with a Big Mac in my hand. If I went to McDonald's twice in one day now, I'd probably puke. I have a healthy relationship with food now. I can still lose weight easily, like if I need to quickly drop a pound or two for a photo shoot or shed my post-baby bulges, but I do it the right way. I might as well make bumper stickers that say, Starvation is not the answer. I still consider myself something of a control freak, though. It's just how I am. I will never be a go-with-the-flow kind of girl, bouncing around like a pinball. I like to know where I'm going, and that I'm in the driver's seat. I want to have my fall wardrobe sorted out by the beginning of the summer. I know how I want my house to look. And when I have a schedule, I like to stick to it. I think this is also part of why I have such a strong work ethic. I always know my lines, I'm always on my mark, and I'm always on time. I take pride in being professional, and I like to set a goal and work toward it. As a teenager, though, you have very few outlets where you can decide what you want for yourself. You probably don't have a job, you can't drive yourself, and you're at this weird transition point when the only way you can have any independence is if someone else decides to give it to you. Controlling what I ate was my one way out. The place where I felt like I got to make the decisions in my life. In my journal, I'd note what I'd eaten that day and what I planned to eat tomorrow. Keeping track and organizing what I ate and the effort it took to hide what I was doing felt like a full-time job, which was actually exactly what I wanted. I wasn't acting at all anymore, and I needed to have something that felt like work. I don't want to trash the idea of going to therapy or taking medication because that is what works for some people, and both can be very valuable tools. It just wasn't what worked for me at that point in my life. Now I go to therapy semi-annually because I think it's a much-needed time out. It helps me to be more introspective, to be more grateful, and to get to know myself in ways that can hopefully make me a better person. My mom is also now my best friend. I've even read her my horrible journal entries, which now come off as laughable odes to teenage angst and melodrama. I still wish she had been more understanding of what I was going through, and I think she does too, but we both understand why she wasn't. I think you're finally an adult when you can look at your parents as people going through their own shit, rather than just seeing them as unfeeling tyrants here to make your life miserable. It also seems like body issues are the norm for a lot of women, and I'm sure more than a few people will read these pages and think, that's me. Being happy with how we look is just something that a lot of us struggle with, and we can name what we hate much more easily than we can name what we love. Some of our parts are too skinny, some are too fat, and some we just hate for no reason. We're always super critical of ourselves, and that leads us to be more critical of other people as well. You see it in all the tabloids that seem to be chomping at the bit to get a pic of someone bending over in a bikini on the beach, just so they can draw a big red circle around the cellulite. So what? We're supposed to make ourselves feel better by making other people feel worse? It doesn't work that way. 
Accepting your body is a lot easier said than done, which is why I think you gotta do what you gotta do to make yourself feel good. People have a lot of opinions about plastic surgery, but more than ten years after I got my boobs, they still make me happy when I look in the mirror. It might have even been the best 8K I've ever spent. Sorry. Wallowing in self-hatred. It's not cute. Starving myself crazy. This did a number on my physical and mental health, and I owe my body a big apology. Stashing my dinner in a drawer rather than eating it. Mom, I am truly sorry you had to discover this decomposing compost heap. Shitty communication. Being better at talking things through would have saved both me and my parents a lot of trouble and tears. Thinking I hated my mom. Moms and teenage daughters will never get along. We just have to realize it's nothing personal on either side. School uniforms. Seriously, they're the worst. Can duty and falling victim to the school's indentured servitude recycling program. Not sorry. Keeping a journal and making lists. I learned early on that writing down your goals is the first step toward achieving them. Boob job. I thank my Coogan for this cleavage. Knowing myself well enough to know that I didn't need antidepressants. Learning to love my body and take care of it, even if I don't think it's perfect. Figuring out ways to get around can duty. Thanks, Dad.